So much string theory. All right, and so uh, we've already talked about uh, the physics of musical instruments a couple times, but we do have some new faces. So I'm going to spend the first few minutes to go back over the basics of the simple harmonic oscillator and how that translates into a musical tone. So with a string instrument, the big important part of it is that you do have a string. And this string is anchored on each end. It's got an elastic property, so whenever you pull it, it has a restoring force causes it to go back to its original shape. And thus, it has all the same elements of the spring problems we've all done in physics 8 billion times. Since it's anchored on each end, that means that by necessity, it's going to form a standing wave with nodes at each end, and it's going to have nodes at interval numbers through it. So you're going to have one wave that has no node in the center and is only zero at the ends. You're going to have another one that has a single node in the center and a wavelength of exactly the full string. One that has a node at one-third and two-thirds, and so on and so forth. And the combination of these, as it applies to each particular string, is what produces the sound. Varying, the, the varying strings and the varying ways in which you plot them is what produces the difference in the sound. So, this is what's actually producing the notes. But, when you pluck a guitar string, for instance, you don't actually produce all of these. Because there's one extra thing that's been introduced. You've already guaranteed, let's say that you pluck it right here, <coughs> you already know there can't be a node there. Because you've moved it all from zero. So you can't have a, a zero point here. Which means that this frequency and every multiple of that frequency is removed from your, from your harmonic frequencies. So you can't have n equals 3, you can't have n equals 6, none of those. If you moved it slightly over, then you would remove those, but you were able to pluck just one particular point rather than having to displace the whole string. That original thing would be restored into it. So this is how the, uh, the difference in where you pluck the string causes a change in the sound. Now there are three ways to actually use a stringed instrument. There is plucking, in which you physically provide potential energy into the string by moving it away from its equilibrium position, and then you allow it to return to its original position. This is the most basic of all of them. There's hammering, in which you don't provide potential energy, you provide a kinetic energy. You give it an initial velocity, cause it to deviate on its own. And then there's bowing, which is kind of a special case, because what you're doing is you're providing a continuous input of energy. So it looks actually slightly different. In bowing, when you have your bow contact the string, let's say you're sliding it across at this point, what happens is friction causes it to slip. and you introduce a kink into the string. So immediately thereafter, this point follows it up and looks like that. Now, this kink is basically a combination of waves and propagates around the string like a combination of waves. So then this turns into and then it's going to reflect around and come back to the, to the bow. When it's traveled the entire length of the string and comes back here, the tension is, is at its highest and is sufficient to cause the thing to slip off from the bow and rebound back down. Once it rebounds back down, the tension and the bow's friction are causing it to go in the same direction and it catches it again. And this strike-slip, strike-slip phenomenon, as it's called, is what actually drives the uh, drives the resonance of the violin string. Now this has a couple effects because the actual strings aren't one-dimensional strings. They have internal structure and the thicker the string 
the more complicated the structure. This means that you have an additional restoring force that causes it to drive away from the pure harmonics and it causes each individual harmonic to start to die off at a different rate. The higher harmonics, the ones that have say 20 or 50 nodes along the string will be the ones to die off first because they'll shift slightly off. These nodes will start moving and as they shift off they start to cancel each other out. Now, the 50th and the 49th harmonic will start to overlap, uh, overlap their maxima and minima pretty quickly. That's why they die faster. This thing takes a long time to get canceled out. Basically, everything else has to go and it'll just die off due to, well, due to energy dissipation, viscosity of the air. And the thicker the string, the greater an effect this has. So the thin strings, the higher notes on your guitar, these higher uh, frequencies die off much more slowly because of that. It's, those frequencies are also only affected by the viscosity of the air, and they die off at basically the same rate. Now when you have a bowed system like this, then you have a continuous driving force in the form of this bow as what, uh, to counter off that effect. So, in general, violins and cellos, have, they maintain their full harmonic spectrum for much longer than a guitar will. And a guitar when plucked will maintain its spectrum for much longer than a guitar when hammered will. Any questions? So, which one rings the longer, the lower strings or the, higher, the thicker, thinner strings? The thinner strings will make... Uh, it's really more dependent on the energy input, but for the most part, the thinner strings have fewer forces to dissipate that energy. It's just, it's just the air. But at the same time, the thinner strings maintain less momentum, so they start off with less. Alright? So, that covers how the strings work. But if I were to just pull a string taut in front of you and pluck it, you'd barely hear anything. You definitely wouldn't hear everything that you hear from a guitar. And the reason for this is the way that the guitar's body is constructed. It's got a resonating chamber immediately underneath them, which causes those sound waves. Normally, a string would just cause a spherical sound wave in every direction, it would dissipate, one as a uh, one over r squared, just like we're all used to energy dissipating, and we wouldn't hear that much, especially in the back corners. But the way that the resonating chamber works, it causes those waves inside there to uh, to begin to uh, add together in the direction of the guitar chambers open, and this is especially prominent for high frequency waves, which are more likely to reflect. The lower the frequency, the more of it gets transmitted through. But high frequency waves get fully reflected, and so you get those, and a lot of the low energy gets projected forward. A decent chunk of the low energy also comes out through the back plate, and very little of it actually comes through the side. So depending on the orientation of the guitar, you actually hear different. So when you're playing a guitar, it doesn't ever sound the same as it does to the audience. Any other questions? So what about the resonating chamber of like an electric guitar? Do you need one there or? There is no resonating chamber in an electric guitar. It, 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 it goes into the amplifier and then. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It uses the pickups to simulate what an electric, uh, what the resonating chamber would do. Well, how does the pick, how do the pickups pick up the frequency? Okay, so it's more of a like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just simple electronic electrodes at the end. Feel the vibrations. Mm -hmm. Yep. Magnetic induction. Actually, the uh, there's a little bit of resonance in, in an electric uh, guitar body, 
that can help give it sustain. So a heavier guitar will tend to actually sustain it a little bit better. Okay. But, but it's not got the same amplification properties that a, an acoustic would have. Right. Can you calculate the resonance frequency of the guitar? So you know, yeah. Give it enough math. Yeah. <laughs> or computer. Get to it, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the pretty amazing thing is that right now, if we were to try and calculate the ideal shape for a guitar that would produce those properties of reinforcing the sounds almost exclusively in one direction, that would be a very impressive amount of math. It was done about four to 500 years ago for violins <coughs> using trial and error. So it's pretty awesome. Any more questions? If not, hidden world of physics.